Greetings, welcome, and thanks for joining today's Wilson Center seminar, Pay the Piper, Latin America's COVID-19 response and prospects for recovery. I am Benjamin Gadan, the deputy director of our Latin American program. We'll be hearing today from three experts with firsthand experience running some of Latin America's largest economies. They are the former finance ministers of Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia, Hernán Lacunza, Eduardo Guardia, and Mauricio Cárdenas. A new report from the OECD calls this pandemic a global health crisis without precedent in living memory, and it says it has triggered the most severe recession in nearly a century. A second wave of infections, the OECD estimates, would result in a 7.6% global GDP decline. Latin America, of course, is hardly shielded from this crisis. In fact, the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, recently called the region the new global epicenter of COVID-19 with rapid spread in Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Peru, Venezuela, and elsewhere. Last month, the UN and the International Labor Organization projected an increase in unemployment in Latin America of 3.4 percentage points. That would bring the unemployment rate for the region to 11.5% this year, an additional 11.5 million individuals without jobs. These projections are no doubt worse today. That report came out just a month ago but the accelerating spread of the disease has resulted in an extension of strict stay-at-home measures. In Argentina, for example, a strict national lockdown that began on March 20th has recently been extended for several more weeks into June. Confronted with these legitimately massive public health needs and the prospect of mass bankruptcies, governments throughout Latin America have announced giant stimulus packages. Though the region had endured years of slow growth before the coronavirus, including rising deficits and debt. Today, the OECD says that such strong fiscal support is warranted, but it has consequences. And it is those consequences we plan to address this morning with our guests, our former finance ministers from Argentina, Colombia, and Brazil. We will look at the responses in Latin America to the public health and economic crises and try to understand how these policies will condition the region's post-coronavirus recovery. I want to thank the sponsor of this event, Imperio Consultores in Buenos Aires, and let you know that you'll be part of our discussion as well. Throughout this conversation, I'd ask you to send your questions on Twitter by direct message or by tagging us. We are at LATAMPROG, P-R-O-G. That's at L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, LATAMPROG. And we'll be addressing your questions at the end of our discussion. I'm going to turn over the conversation now to our moderator, Lucio Castro. He's a senior fellow at Harvard Center for International Development, a global fellow at the Wilson Center. He's also Argentina's former alternate executive director at the Inter-American Development Bank. I want to thank you again for being with us this morning and for following our extensive coverage of the impacts of COVID-19 in Latin America and direct you to our website, wilsoncenter.org backslash LAP for Latin American program for more of our analysis and events on this important subject. Again, thank you for being here. Lucio, please go right ahead. Thank you, Ben. Hello, it's a real pleasure to be with you today, uh, chairing this panel with such a distinguished uh, speakers. Let me start by briefly introducing them. Uh, Join us today, Mauricio Cárdenas. He's the former Minister of Finance of Colombia. He served under President Manuel Calderón administration, and he's currently professor at CIPA at Columbia University. He has a distinguished long career as public official and academic in Colombia and here in the US. We have also with us Eduardo Guardia. He's also a former minister of Brazil. He served under Michael Temer's administration in 2018. He's currently partner and CEO at BTG Pactual Asset Management. And he has a long career occupying different senior positions at the Minister of Finance of Brazil and in the state of San Paulo. Finally, he joined us also today, Nala Kunza. He's the former Minister of Finance. He served under Mauricio Macri's administration in 2019. He previously served also as Minister of Finance at the province of Buenos Aires, and manager at Argentina Central Bank. He runs Empiria Consultores in Buenos Aires. I would like to stress that our three speakers besides being former Minister of Finance, Jerry Common Fisher. 
they led their country's economies through massive macroeconomic storms. Therefore, they can offer a unique per perspective on how Latin America is facing this unprecedented COVID-19 shock and what could be the way out of the crisis for the region. Cárdenas dealt with the oil crisis in Colombia in 2014, which entailed a fall in Colombian exports of more than 40%. Likewise, Guardia dealt with the economic crisis in 2014 in Brazil that demanded a dramatic fiscal consolidation. Alacunza was in charge of managing the Argentine economy in the crisis that originated in the aftermath of Macri's defeat in the 2019 primary election. So I would like to start by asking our panelists about their views on Latin America's economic perspective in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. The World Bank recently updated, last Tuesday actually, its projections on the global economy, which indicated that Latin America will be the region that will experience the largest economic contraction, contraction this year, with a 7% decline in GDP and with per capita income levels not recovering its pre-crisis level until 2022. So I would like to start by asking you, and we're going to follow alphabetic order on this, so the first speaker is going to be Mauricio Gardeners. What's your view on the economic perspectives for Latin America, and particularly on what would be the shape of the recovery in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis? Are we going to see a B, a U, an L or a W type of recovery, or perhaps Latin America will be facing like a Nike logo, Nike logo kind of recovery with a permanent loss in recovery. So first, let's start with Mauricio Cárdenas, then uh, Guardia, and finally Lacunza. Mauricio. Well, thank you very much, Lucio. Um, thanks for having me in this panel. I'm delighted. I'm very honored. Um, Thank you, Ben, for your introductory remarks as well. And, um, and uh, I'm very happy to be sharing this with two very respected uh, colleagues, uh, Eduardo and Hernan. And I think the combination of views from Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia could also help illustrate the audience about some of the aspects in which there are differences within the region. Because we tend to speak about Latin America as a general concept as a broad uh, idea, but there are important differences that must be highlighted. But let's begin with this more general question about the shape of the recovery that Lucio just asked us. Today, the OECD launched a new report, which is basically a revision of the um, growth outlook uh, for the world. Um, and it does um, include a very worrisome scenario of a potential um, um, event that could occur at the end of this year, which would make things a lot worse, which is a new wave of the COVID-19, in which countries would go again into lockdowns, and then the, the world will have a 10% GDP contraction uh, in 2020. The shape of the recovery that the OECD is portraying today is one in which the dramatic collapse in output is not compensated at least until the end of 2021. By the end of 2021, the world will still be about six percentage points below what it would have been um, in absence of the COVID-19, which means that the recovery is neither a V recovery or a W recovery or an L recovery. It's something that looks uh, different from any letter in our alphabet, which is a severe decline with uh, some recovery, but mild um, to the point that the world will still well below its level of income uh, or the expected level of income that we had a few months ago. I think that pretty much also applies for Latin America. And let me say a word about Latin America. Latin America was already the slowest growing region in the world prior to the COVID-19. So we already had a severe growth problem in Latin America. We were 
the slowest economy last year, and we were expected to be, um, and we had been in that position for the, la for the past five years, and we were expected to underperform um, in the future as well, relative to other regions of the world. Well, I think COVID-19 has just amplified that. It means that if Latin America was doing um, relatively uh, uh, bad uh, before COVID-19, it will do um, even worse after COVID-19. And let me explain why, and I'll end with this. Uh, ben had just said, and rightly said, that uh, the World Health Organization and uh, PAHO, our Pan American Health Organization, uh, have just said formally that the new epicenter of the COVID is Latin America. And this is a fact. This is where we have the fastest um, a growing number of cases uh, in the world today. Latin America is not as well prepared to deal with this situation as the previous epicenters like China, Southern Europe, the US, um, because we're, in, we're not in a position where we can do whatever it takes. We can do whatever we can. We all have limitations, mostly from the fiscal point of view, but we also have limitations that have to do with the initial health infrastructure, with the operational capacity of our governments that are slower to react and to respond, the lower coverage of our social safety nets, a number of issues make Latin America a region where the response is not as strong as it has been in other parts of the world. This is why we are now in a gray area in which we still have not controlled the pandemic, but yet, there are many Latin Americans and many you know, citizens in, in our cities that are going out because they need to generate some income because they don't have a safety net that protects them. So they need to go out and begin working. So we're in a world in which at the same time, we're dealing with a pandemic on the one hand, we have, without having controlled the pandemic, our R, that very famous uh, metric, uh, it's still above one. In most of Latin America, that means that the number of people that are uh, infected uh, per person that has the COVID is greater than one on average. Um, and at the same time, we're uh, dealing with a very severe economic shock, uh, which is you know, reflected in very high unemployment rates. So this is a really worrisome situation for Latin America. I hope we have time in the rest of the conversation to talk about what to do, how to respond, what are the challenges. But um, uh, I think at this stage, it's just uh, important to state that um, this is clearly the region that will suffer the most as a result of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. Now I would like to um, uh, allow um, Eduardo Guardia to have his views on, on this question. So what do you think is going to be the shape of the recovery in Latin America in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis? What are your thoughts on this? I think we can hear him. He's muted. Are you muted, Eduardo? Not anymore. Can you yeah. hear? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Lucio and Ben, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and to share this debate with Mauricio. And then uh, I, I think we pretty much agree with what Mauricio said, that uh, it's going to be a difficult situation for Latin America, particularly because of the starting point of Latin America, the, the countries of the region were not growing fast before uh, this crisis started. And second and very important, our capacity to respond is much smaller when you compare to developed countries, particularly because of the fiscal constraints that we have in, in all the region. Having said that, uh, Latin America is also a very heterogeneous uh, region. So I, I don't think we can, uh, uh, the, the, the impact of the pandemic is different in each country. For example, Colombia was much less affected than Brazil when you look to the numbers of uh, uh, new cases or death per 1 million inhabitants, we see that the impact in Brazil has been much higher than the impact in Colombia. Chile had a higher impact, but the government had a very good reaction uh, in terms of implementing policies to mitigate the negative impacts of the crisis. So I, I, my guess would be that countries like Colombia and Chile 
would be would have a faster recovery and most important uh, would not be as affected in 2020 as countries like brazil so talking more about brazil and uh, we have to recognize that our starting point before this pandemic start was very challenging brazil has not been growing since 2016 actually we had a contraction in 2015 2016 we were trying to recover since then but with a very small growth 1.3 1.1% a year so when this started in brazil we already had very high unemployment rate around 11 12% in the beginning of this year and the perspectives for the economy to recover in 2019 before the, the pandemic was not very we were about 2% not more than that and we, we are we are still dealing with our fiscal problems and the need the need to implement important reforms so my view uh, for brazil for this year is that the contraction will be uh, very uh, big we are talking about we, we still have a lot of uncertainties but uh, i i think uh, the the gdp contraction this year in brazil should be between seven to ten percent which is huge if you look to uh, growth perspectives for next year it's between two and a half to three and a half percent so I, I fully agree with what mauricio said at the end of 21 we will be at much lower level than uh, we were in the beginning of this year in terms of gdp per capita and gdp uh, growth so it's a very challenging situation for latin america as a whole and uh, for brazil i think the recover will depend pretty much on our ability uh, to implement the reforms that we still need not only on the fiscal front but also to improve to increase the productivity of the brazilian economy we can go into the details during the q a but i i think the message that we, i i have to start is uh, about brazil the impact of the disease is very big we are talking about over 740,000 cases in Brazil, 38,000 deaths so far. It's, uh, it's difficult to say whether we are close to the peak or not. Uh, I, I see the numbers improving in states like Amazonas, Pernambuco, it seems to be stable in Sao Paulo, the number of new diseases and new deaths, but this is reflecting the social distancing, distancing measures that we had in place until today and we are beginning to flexibilize this social distancing uh, rule so i don't know what's going to happen going forward we have to monitor this so it seems to be to, to me that we, we should be uh, at the peak but it will depend on the behavior after the flexibilization of social distance so uh, the government measures were very strong in brazil i can go into details during the q a but it will not be enough to to avoid the strong gdp gdp contraction this year thank you eduardo uh, very clear remarks on, on the situation in brazil and we can deepen on on those uh, remarks on the q a's now i would like to leave the floor to hernan lacunza hernan again i'm going to repeat the question so we would like to know your thoughts on the on the shape of the recovery in Latin America in the aftermath of the COVID-19 um, crisis. So please go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Lucio and Benjamin, for the invitation. And of course, my pleasure to be with my colleagues, Mauricio and Eduardo. Uh, just to complement the view, so let me say that I, I think that the, the impact and the, and the eventual recovery or the, or the future of the, of the coronavirus crisis in, in the region, well, it will depends basically on, on, on three uh, conditions. First of all, which was the, the, the starting point. Of course, it will not be the same if the economy uh, and, and perhaps we cannot take the Latin America as a whole uh, to, to consider it as, as an homogeneous group because it, it will not be the same of course if the economy was um, behaving was growing at, at, the, at the sustainable growth at, at the sustainable rate or uh, as in the case of Argentina uh, it had been uh, in a recession period for one year and a half and, and also 
uh, in a financial stress situation because of some debts about the sustainability of the of the that. And in, in second second place, uh, the other key issue is, is uh, which are the economic and, and basically the, the fiscal resources available to face the, the, the crisis, the turmoil, of course, it's not the same. If you have uh, said previously like Chile and, and, you, and the, the, um, it's some uh, counter cyclical fiscal um, funds are available to face the, the fiscal and financial package to smooth the impact on private uh, sector or like Peru or, or, or even Brazil or Colombia or, or many countries of the regions which were able to access to the voluntary market credit again to smooth the impact on the private sector at, at a very reasonable rates. Particularly it happens, it began to happen uh, in May, since May and, and, and it's not the same for a country which where the, the, the market credit is not so uh, available. The third point is, I think, the structural conditions, not only economic, but also social conditions of, 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 of each economy. You know, as you probably know, uh, let me ex uh, do an example of the Argentine case. You know that uh, this trade-off, uh, of course, uh, in Latin America and in Argentina, there has been a mix between the response to the health threat, the, to the health uh, threat, and the policies to cushion the economic effects of the lockdown. And if you probably know, in Argentina, in this trade off, Argentina uh, has adopted the corner solution to face the pandemic crisis, assuming a very strict uh, quarantine to minimize the health risk. And for several weeks, for example, Argentina was leading the government response stringency index of the Oxford University that we all use to, to measure the, the, these uh, restrictions. Uh, but perhaps at the cost of a higher economic recession in terms of activity and employment, the forecast for this year is a fall of 10% in the Argentine production, which is, I think, uh, higher than the rest of the region, like uh, Chile, 4%, or Peru, or even in Brazil, about 6%. I don't know if it is correct, uh, uh, Eduardo. But uh, perhaps uh, this corner strategy, uh, strategy in Argentina is more related to the previous uh, fragility. Uh, for example, having uh, one third of population under the poverty line, which means a large part of vulnerable neighborhoods in overcrowded conditions, especially in the Buenos Aires city surroundings, and a health system which is fragmented in private and public suppliers, some provided by unions, and other parts of national governments. Uh, so well, which uh, we spent 10% of our annual GDP in the, in the health system, but it is, uh, we, it is not ready to face a huge crisis like the, the, the COVID one. So, uh, under this framework, the corner solution was not so much an option and like an, an, a requirement of reality. Um, in, under this framework, the, 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 the policy response of the government was also conditioned by the scarcity of resources because of the, of the, of the lack of previous counter-cyclical funds and because of the limited or, or, or null access to the voluntary credit market. Uh, the size of the package is about 4% of GDP, which is not uh, too small for a country like, like Argentina. But let me finish this um, first answer by saying that uh, a, 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 an additional risk for a country like Argentina, where uh, all the, the, the fiscal measures uh, like subsidies and, and uh, financial support so to, to, to firms to, to, to preserve employment, are being uh, funded by monetary issuance. So uh, the risk ahead is that we may be incubating, may be uh, accumulating a nominal instability problem ahead. That is uh, to the picture, to the common picture of having some victims in the health system and also the common pictures of having some companies um, problems of, of solvency or, or, or in, uh, some firms or, or, or shop uh, loses uh, 
um, a, a bad business would be to add a star picture which may be a nominal instability in the inflation acceleration ahead or 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 or, or, or instability in the FX market uh, because uh, underestimating the risk of um, find, find funding this this package this fiscal package package only by uh, monetary issuance so that's the case for Argentina so the the the, 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 the package to, to to face the crisis has to uh, take into account this uh, risk too So thank you, Anand. Thank you for, for your comments. Uh, your comments and also Mauricio's comments lead me to the next question, which is related to the macroeconomic policy response of the governments in the region to this massive macroeconomic shock. As Ben also stressed before, depending on the fiscal space, on the prior macroeconomic situation, and perhaps more critically, on their capability to tap international financial markets, Latin American governments and central banks have responded with expansionary monetary policies and massive fiscal income support programs. You have commented on your views on your own countries, uh, on how adequate or not have been the responses, but I would like also to ask you, uh, how do you envision if there are any macroeconomic risks in the aftermath of the crisis as a result of this monetary and fiscal expansion in your countries. So maybe we can start with Mauricio commenting on that. So the question has two parts. First of all is how, how do you uh, evaluate the response of the Colombian government to the crisis? And secondly, how do you envision are the risks uh, related to these macroeconomic responses to the crisis in the medium term for Colombia? Well, that's a great question. Uh, let me try to answer it. Again, looking at the broad perspective of Latin America, and perhaps at the end, I can make a comment about Colombia specifically, but there are risks. That's very clear. And um, the risks can actually be quite severe. We may end up in a, another lost decade for Latin America. Could uh, eventually lead to a series of problems that will manifest themselves throughout the decade causing a lot more pain than just the COVID-19 directly. I mean, once the pandemic is over, which I think will happen, we just don't know when, maybe months, maybe years, um, we're gonna be left with some of the consequences. And therefore, what we're doing now entails some risks. Let me discuss why. Um, there are two basic responses here, the monetary and the fiscal response. On the fiscal side, the first thing I'd like to say is that there is an implicit race by government on who's doing the largest response. So countries are looking at each other, um, governments compare themselves, and uh, people in the streets complain about the lack of response by the government of X country relative to what Y country uh, did. Um, and I guess the um, examples today are Chile and Peru that have been able to respond in a, in a very significant way. But the truth is that that race, in my view, um, is not constructive because many countries are adding to their numbers, to their stimulus numbers, um, things that are very different. So we're comparing really apples and oranges. Um, some countries add to their fiscal response the amount of credit that the commercial banks are lending uh, because that lending is supported by some form of credit guarantees. But that's not in itself government expenditures. So in my view, these comparisons do not say much. Also, it depends on whether you're looking at the central government or the general government or the entire public sector. But they're being used for basically making sure that countries respond as aggressively as possible. But at the end of the day, we're gonna be left with more debt. I mean, I don't think there's any country in the region that will take the cost of this response out of previous savings. 
everyone is going to have to borrow and is, ha is going to have to borrow in a very aggressive way. Let me give you the numbers for Colombia. Colombia's public debt was 50% of GDP at the end of 2019, 50%. Um, the Ministry of Finance expects public debt in Colombia to raise to 65% of GDP by the end of this year. So it's a 15 percentage points of GDP increase in just one year. Mm -hmm. Of course, such a large debt causes problems, especially with the rating agencies, which is a whole chapter that we should talk about. And for a country like Colombia, it's a very delicate issue because we're at the very threshold where we could lose our investment uh, grade uh, rating. Mm -hmm. And that's a major concern because that could affect investment, that could affect, of course, the great rating of the corporate sector as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a serious issue. And let me conclude with the monetary aspect. So monetary, um, the monetary response across the board has been um, uh, very significant with basically stimulus measures. Some countries have been a little bit more prudent than others. For example, Brazil. I just read an interview by the governor of the central bank saying that he would like to use all the tools that are available before they jump into QE. Well, Colombia did jump into QE early on, purchasing assets uh, from the private sector, purchasing actually bonds issued by the private sector. Um, but the response here has been aggressive everywhere, cutting interest rates and doing some monetary expansion. Perhaps Argentina, and I'm sure Nan can comment about this, is the more extreme example because the fiscal expansion is being financed by uh, printing money, money, you know, primary uh, uh, financing to the government. So that entails more risks because of that, of course, in the future could actually push more uh, inflation and a greater depreciation of the currency. But that's not an issue today. But in the future, all these monetary expansions can also result, uh, could also bring risks associated uh, with, uh, with inflation. But just to say that at the end of the day, uh, this, is a, this is a response that will have some costs. We'll need to pay for this. Mm -hmm. The managing director of the IMF said, you know, this is a time that you should not worry about doing whatever you need to, but make sure you keep your receipts because you're gonna to have to pay them. And the time will arrive when we'll have to pay this. And this is, very, this is gonna be very unpleasant news because there is only, way, there is only one way you can pay these bills, raise taxation or cut government expenditures. And that's what no one wants to talk about in the region today. Thank you, Mauricio. And now we turn to Eduardo Guardia. Eduardo, again, the question relates to two different aspects. The first one is on the adequacy of the uh, government's response on the fiscal and the monetary front in Brazil, but more generally in the region to the COVID-19 crisis. And the second uh, issue in this question uh, relates to the risk that these responses have in the medium term for the region, and again, particularly for the case of Brazil. So okay. if you can have your, your comments on this briefly. Thank sure, you. Lucio. Let me start with the first question about the, the quality of the response from the Brazilian government. I think it was, it was good in terms of the impact and of the measures they implemented. We can split the, the reaction in three main initiatives. The first one was an important increase in the expenditure with health, talking about building new hospitals, new beds, new ICUs to provide uh, equipment for health professionals. So, it is working well at the three levels of governments. Most of these initiatives belongs to the subnational governments uh, and the federal government is transferring money to states and municipalities to support these additional expenditures with health. So I think we are doing a, a good job on this front. So uh, second one, uh, which is very important to mitigate the impact of this pandemic is the cash transfer programs for informal workers and uh, low, in low income households. So more than 55 million people in Brazil received cash transfer over the last three months. So it, it was a, a very important program. Brazil has a strong social safety net uh, uh, program. So it was mm -hmm. easier for Brazil to use this infrastructure 
to transfer this money to low income households in Brazil. And as mm -hmm. I said, 55 million people is a lot of people. They received from $125 a month to $250 a month. And this has just been extended for another two months. This was announced yesterday. So this was effective. It was important to mitigate the impacts of, uh, of the crisis, particularly to the more vulnerable part of the population. And I, I think the reaction here was good. Of course, there is a big fiscal impact behind that. The third line of uh, uh, action was to prove, and here we have the central bank initiative and the treasury initiative. Uh, on the central bank front, I think they did a very good job, not only lowering interest rates, so interest rates in Brazil is 3% in nominal, nominal terms, probably we will go to 2.25 uh, next week. It's the lower we, ha we have ever had. Uh, uh, and so ba central bank is using monetary policy to give this stimulus and also is providing liquidity to the market, basically by uh, providing some credit lines to banks to lend uh, to corporations in Brazil. What has happened is that the, the money uh, went to large corporates. It's working. But when you look to small and mid-sized companies, uh, uh, the, the money is not there yet. So that's what's still pending in Brazil. The Treasury announced a credit line uh, for small and mid-sized companies. They were supposed to spend 40 billion reais in this credit line, but they only spent 2 billion reais. So it's clearly not working. The government was not able to give the money to provide the liquidity to small and mid-sized companies. So I think that's what's missing in Brazil. And this week, the government is an announcing a new program to make sure uh, they will be able to deliver this money to small and mid-sized companies. What I really want to emphasize here, which is important for the second question, is that all the measures that have been implemented in Brazil so far with respect mm -hmm. with fiscal impact are temporary. So the, the government was allowed to spend more, but only related to the actions necessary to mitigate the impacts of the COVID. So this is very important because we cannot uh, uh, afford to have permanent fiscal expansion considering our starting point. So that's, we have to do what we have to do now as long as it is temporary. And mm -hmm. so far it has been temporary. Uh, in terms of monetary policy, we did approve a constitutional amendment to allow the central bank to buy corporate bonds and treasury uh, bonds. We didn't mm -hmm. have this authorization up to today. Uh, okay. So now we can have our quantitative easing. But as Mauricio said, I don't think we are going to use that because what we are going to do in Brazil, in my view, is just reduce interest rates and use the fiscal expansion to mitigate the crisis. So these will be financed with uh, public debt. So going to the second question, of course, there are risks involved because the debt will go from 80% of GDP to 95 or even 100% of GDP, depending on GDP growth going forward. So it's huge. We are going to finance that, issuing new debt. I think what's going to happen is that we are going to reduce the duration of the public debt. Brazil mm -hmm. can afford to finance that, uh, mm -hmm. but reducing the duration of the debt, which brings in the future some risks, of course, all over risk. But what will, uh, what's really relevant here is that if we keep the fiscal expansion temporary, we will have to continue with the reform agenda that we have today in Brazil to reduce public expenditure, to try to avoid an increase in taxation. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, if we will be able to avoid an increase in taxation in the future to pay for this fiscal expansion. But if we keep the expenditure ex uh, expansion temporary, we have a risk, we have a chance to avoid increase in taxation if we are able to continue with the reforms administrative reform and we do have to reduce the size of the public sector in Brazil and the size of public expenditure in Brazil it's too high. So we have a risk and the risk is that it can affect growth going forward if we have to finance this fiscal expenditure with higher taxation. So that's uh, uh, but the, the, the message is so far all the expansion is temporary. This is good news for Brazil.
Thank you, Eduardo, for a very clear your, your answer and also your highlighting the, the medium-term risk of, of the response in, in the case of Brazil. Now I want to turn to Hernán Lacunza and Argentina. Hernán, you, uh, you had a Ukraine cross with a very clear message on all the restrictions that the Argentine economy is facing. So we would like to have your views on how adequate or not was the response of the Argentine government on the fiscal and the monetary fronts to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, you mentioned also some of the risk that entails this massive expansion in monetary policy to finance the fiscal impulse. But uh, I would like you to, to talk about much more on, on that in depth, if you can, in a few minutes. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lucio. Let me uh, link your new question with the previous one and uh, the, uh, about the, the, the outlook of, of an eventual recovery and the form of recovery uh, that I don't mention before. Uh, perhaps in the region, but also in Argentina, there may be an initial V-shaped recovery once the quarantine has been raised from the supply side, because many firms, for example, many firm, firms of the, of the industrial sector will be rebounding from the bottom level of perhaps hopefully, hopefully April in Argentina, but after this initial rebound from the supply side, likely the economy will face new limits on the demand side because of the fall of household incomes and higher unemployment and higher poverty, around 14% in, in, in Argentina of unemployment and more than 40% of, of poverty uh, by sure uh, in, the near, in the near future. So after the further rebound, the economy may go back in Argentina to the stagnation process that we had before the COVID crisis. I think that, going to, to new question, I think that uh, the, the response, the, the, the policy response, economic policy response, taking into account the, the, the restrictions, the constraints that I mentioned before, well, it began, it, it began not very, very few focused uh, that, that was trying to reinforce the budget of public works, which is a conventional, more fine approach uh, of Keynesian reaction to typical crisis of follow demand. But then it was reasonable, accurate to, to preserve employment and to support incomes of more uh, vulnerable sectors. As I said before, unfortunately, well, uh, I, and the, the, the it, it, um, it, um, okay happened uh, with a deterioration of the fiscal front and the, the fiscal deficit in late 2019 had been uh, the primary deficit was close to, to zero was a, a only half percent of, of, of GDP and now it is going rapidly to six percent of GDP, GDP and as I mentioned before it is being financed everything by a uh, monetary issuance that may be uh, incubating a higher inflation ahead with the uh, risk uh, that we cannot be seeing it today because of the natural increase in the in the liquidity preferences of, of people under quarantine but it is on also it is all uh, of course uh, a transitory uh, force that may not be uh, there when the quarantine uh, is relaxed. So I will say, Lucio, um, that the, the, uh, even with these uh, limits in resources and in the um, trade access, uh, I think that the government should be more clear uh, in defining and communicating its program for the day before, for the day after the crisis. That is, it is not uh, clear how much of the increase in expenditures and the public expenditures that may be reasonable in the crisis, but not uh, forever, how much of this uh, increase in expenditures that, for example, grew 35% in April in real, ter in real terms, uh, and of course, in, cost with, in contrast with uh, um, lower uh, revenues, fiscal revenues of 22% also in real, in, in real terms. So this trend is not sustainable, but the government is not being clear how much of this is uh, permanent and how much of this is uh, transitory because some of these trends had, be had begun uh, before the, 
the health crisis. It had begun during the summer. Uh, so it is not clear yet uh, how much of, of it is consequence of the crisis and how much of this is uh, a very voluntary approach that uh, may be uh, thinking that this kind of, uh, as, as Mauricio said before, this kind of uh, solution of printing money to support or to, to, fun, to, to finance the, the excess of expenditures may be uh, permanent. I, I, I will ask for the government to, to, to put it clear after or, or, or now, but for, for, for the day after the crisis, which would be the fiscal program, the financial program, the, the monetary program, how much in, under this con, even under this condition of uh, fiscal dominance of the monetary policy, it uh, should be clear how much would be the requirements of the treasury to be funded by the central bank. And of, I think, Lucio, that it will be even useful for today because you know that we are now facing uh, turbulences in the FX market. Um, some of them are related to the, to the current uh, uh, money printing, but also uh, for the future monetary printing, money printing or, or monetary issuance, because it, it, as it is not clear, uh, the market is uh, taking into account this uh, uncertainty uh, and is uh, anticipating, as always happen, uh, this uncertainty to the current uh, market. So, and finally, uh, perhaps a good um, or, or a goal of the, of the, of the, of the, of the transition of the, of the policy during the crisis is not to damage the permanent um, platform to, to, to regain uh, growth in the future. That is, the previous government, the previous economic program has not been successful in providing welfare in terms of uh, boosting growth or uh, lowering inflation uh, during the last four years. But it had been very responsible and successful in, in giving as a legacy a better platform to, 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 to grow ahead that was with fiscal and ex external equilibrium, equilibrium with a competitive realization rate, with tariff rate of utilities that were close to production costs. Well, all these uh, pillars uh, are being eroded during the, the, the transition or during the crisis, but uh, of course, it, it has to, they have to be uh, rebuilt sooner than later in order to uh, be able to, 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 to have a, a, a consistent program uh, to boost growth since 2021 and ahead. Great, thank you. I think now we have a question from the audience. Please, Ben, go ahead. Indeed, thank you. And, and in the last 10 minutes or so that we have, please also feel free other participants to, to share questions. Again, we're receiving them in direct messages on Twitter at LATAMPROG, LATAMPROG, um, so you can uh, tag us or you can send those. The question, I think, for you, Mauricio, but others can weigh in. I know we're, we're mostly talking economics here. The post-pandemic picture that you, Mauricio, and others have painted is rather orthodox approaches, meaning finance ministers will look at a debt overhang and decide at some point some version of austerity might be needed um, or some combination of budget cuts and tax increases, and you've analyzed what that would do to the recovery. There's also other political scenarios, though, uh, populism emerging in countries that are dissatisfied with the, the government they have, whether there were already, as we know, in 2019, a lot of dissatisfaction in Latin America. Governments will emerge from this with even fewer resources to address the public services and the economic inequality that spurred a whole year of, of really destabilizing protests in a lot of the region. So my question for you, Mauricio, is what will be the political impacts of this and what will be the impact on recovery if it isn't as traditional an approach as, as you've envisioned in your earlier remarks? Well, great. Let's, let's bring in politics. It's very important. And, um, and by the way, that's unique to the Wilson Center, that blending of economics and politics. So um, you're in DC, I presume. You're in, in, in the Washington area. Uh, you guys in the U.S. 
have been experiencing social protests, social unrest, and uh, curfews in the past few days. Well, this is exactly what Latin America had, not particularly Brazil and Argentina, but many other countries, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia, uh, prior to the pandemic. We were uh, in a very intense wave at the end of last year of social unrest, and in many parts of the region, including Colombia, there were curfews, which we hadn't seen in decades. Um, I think since I was a teenager, there were no curfews here in Colombia. So anyway, um, is there a risk that after the pandemic, we go the same way that the US is going now? Do we go back to social unrest? Do we go back to uh, you know, people in the streets and curfews? It's kind of like paradoxical that we go from lockdowns to curfews uh, because it just shows that, it shows that the politics are not right. Um, well, there is a high risk that that happens in Latin America, not because, uh, not only because of racial issues, which has been mostly the case in the US, but because of the great social divide that exists in Latin America, that in some ways is being amplified by the pandemic. Because just think about this, half of the households in Colombia, and I'm sure it's not that different in other parts of Latin America, do not have access to broad, broadband internet, which means that during the pandemic, their kids were not able to get the education that they needed. So the, 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 the technological digital divide is huge and that just being, is being amplified uh, during the lockdowns. Or the informal workers that are not being able to generate income, they're losing income, they're losing uh, 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 purchasing power and they're of course falling into poverty. But anyway, so this may be the source of the next wave of social unrest. And it's very possible that next year being a pre-electoral year in many countries, there will be a wave of populism. And let me be clear here. The region already has populism, it has populism in Mexico, it has populism in Brazil, but not necessarily fiscal populism. So we may be entering the stage and the era of fiscal populism because it's gonna be very easy for, fee for people to try to get votes for those elections, advocating basically a debt default. We don't have to pay all this debt, uh, changing the economic model, and that may generate some traction from the point of view of voters. It's gonna be difficult, but necessary that someone comes to the political contest and says, look, this is the time to be responsible. We accumulated a lot of debt and we need to pay it because otherwise our growth is not gonna look good, not just this year or next year, but during this whole decade. So pragmatism has to prevail and we have to make sure that these fiscal populists that will emerge are kept at bay, under control. Great, thank you, Mauricio. I just want to open up this question to, to the other speakers, but I want to add something, something else. I mean, you were referring to this kind of dire um, perspective for Latin America in the aftermath of the crisis, but something that we haven't mentioned, I think only Hernan mentioned it briefly, is the more kind of structural view of Latin America. As you mentioned, Mauricio, and also Nan and, and Eduardo, Latin America has been showing a very disappointing macroeconomic performance before the crisis. And most of this disappointing macroeconomic performance is due to very low productivity in the region. So I would like to know uh, your views, your thoughts, on this more kind of structural long-term agenda. Of course, there are issues related to the fiscal, necessary fiscal consolidation after the crisis and how to kind of tap these uh, excesses that are necessary during the crisis in terms of fiscal stimuli. But I would like to know your thoughts on this more structural reforms agenda. Maybe we can start with Eduardo, who mentioned that in the case of Brazil. So going beyond fiscal policy, what are the uh, kind of this uh, new agenda or this structural agenda uh, for Brazil? Uh, Lucio, this is a very important discussion for Brazil. And uh, we have been discussing this for a long time in Brazil, the need for reform. So basically, I think uh, we have a big challenge on the fiscal front to keep the expenditures under control. And that's why we have approved the spending cap 
So it's very important to keep the spending cap and to improve the quality of fiscal policy. But it goes much beyond that, as you said. Uh, uh, one of the problems we have in Brazil is that we are still a very close economy. So it's very important for Brazil to open up the economy because I do believe it will help to increase the productivity of Brazilian economy. So if you look at the chain of commerce in Brazil, it's only 25% of GDP. So we have to export more and we have to import more if you want to become a more competitive economy. So this is a tough discussion. I, I, I tried to move in this direction when I was at the government. The resistance are huge, but we have to go into this direction. So to open up the economy. Second, uh, we have to reduce the size of the public sector in Brazil. Uh, one good example, water and sewage. We don't have a supply of water and sewage to the whole population. Only half percent of the population have full access to water and sewage. They are controlled by state-owned companies. We have to privatize them and to bring the private sector to invest under uh, clear rules to provide the service to the population. These will increase uh, investment in infrastructure. That's another area we need the private sector to offer this infrastructure, infrastructure to the Brazilian population. Uh, and uh, so these are the, the, the three lines, and last but not least, tax reform, because we have a very complex and regressive tax system. So that's what we have to do in Brazil. I, I know it's a very complex question. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to highlight the yeah, no, sure. this last comment, yeah. very important. We have to keep the social safety net system we have in Brazil. When we look to Chile, a country that has done everything right over the last 30 years, why they had the problems they had? In my view, because they do not build the social safety net protection as we have in Brazil. So this is extremely important uh, for Latin America countries. Excellent. Well, we are coming to the end of this. I think we are running out of time. I don't know. Ben, if we can uh, leave Edouard, uh, Hernan, sorry, just two minutes to kind of uh, give us uh, his thoughts on this structured agenda for Argentina. Sure, two, two minutes would be wonderful. Thank you, Hernan. Well, two minutes for a structured agenda is very generous, thank you. Uh, <laughs> now, just a, a few comments. Uh, like, uh, the, like it says the, the, the Chinese about having the pandemic may also be an opportunity ahead. Um, I think that the worst scenario would be to read the crisis, to, to read the crisis like an external problem generated abroad and to dismiss all the internal factors like having the third part of households in vulnerable situ situation or, or, a, or a health system that it is not um, adequate to face this kind of, of, of problems because of our own problems and also uh, to underestimate the fiscal and operational, operational limits of the public sector of our countries to the current counter-cyclical policies because neither public saving funds accumulated during sunny days like, or nor voluntary credit market access like, like some countries but not in Argentina. Well, this would be the bad reaction and uh, to, to uh, a, a bad thing or a good a good thing would be to avoid surface conclusions by based on fragmented evidence from other countries like well we need a larger sec a public sector without without answering how we, we will we will be able to finance it through higher taxes more public debt more monetary issues are not uh, really a good solution as as I we 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 proved during uh, the last uh, decade so uh, or in the same sense, to close borders, to, tra to trade, that was also a, a, a risky reaction in our region mm -hmm. that uh, without taking into account that we are net winners of the, of the, of the an opening uh, trade war uh, because of our competitive advantages. The, opp the opportunity will be linked with um, Overcoming the antagonic projects that have been altern alternating in, 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 our, in office in Argentina for 50 year, years, and to be to have it clear that we need uh, a, 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 a program that focuses in job creation and in, uh, in in boosting exports, just to give. Um, social sustainability that it, it is needed to it is to 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 support uh, 
any political program and exports also also needed to uh, give uh, economic sustainability to any program uh, to avoid the stop and go process that we have uh, in the last decade. Right, so uh, Sorry, sorry. Uh, we ran out of time. Sorry for interrupting. Sorry, but sorry. Okay, next time. That we ran out of time. Sorry for that. No, no, and thank you. Just very briefly, Mauricio, Eduardo, Hernan, Lucio. That was a, a spectacular conversation. Um, it's obviously a dark chapter economically for the region, and we'll see if the politics um, plays a pragmatic role, Mauricio, as, as you and I and others hope it does, or if it turns in directions of, of closed economies. Um, and unsustainable uh, fiscal and monetary policies. We hope it doesn't, and we hope that, you know, just as the public health measures and stimuli are rising to the occasion, that in the response to this, the policies can help uh, bring about sustainable recoveries. Thank you so much to everyone for participating and for your questions. Thank you so much to our expert panelists. This was enlightening and extremely valuable. Thank you again. Have a wonderful morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.